Last week on the podcast, we examined the economic concept of creative destruction and asked whether or not Silicon Valley, as a proxy for the American tech sector, has reached an inflection point in its brief history. This video is a shortened version of the podcast to give you an overview of the concept and the question at hand. UNFTR. One of the most notable economists in modern times is Joseph Schumpeter, who's credited with coining the term creative destruction. In his seminal work, Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy, Schumpeter muses on the possibility that innovation might have a ceiling because humans no longer desire the next new thing. It's hard to imagine given our rabidly consumptive behavior, but as my friend from Brooklyn says, there's too much good weed and free porn in the world today. Here's Schumpeter. Quote, the possibility that the economic wants of humanity might someday be so completely satisfied that little motive would be left to push productive efforts still further ahead, a more or less stationary state would ensue. Capitalism, being essentially an evolutionary process, would become atrophic, end quote. So essentially, he believed that there was a limit to innovation under capitalism and that a form of what he called sober socialism would naturally occur at the end of innovation. Schumpeter can be considered an economist in the Marxian tradition to an extent, but he was entirely more optimistic about the benefits of capitalism and the potential for a peaceful transition to socialism, one that would be brought about by the last of the innovations caused by creative destruction. So let's first define the term before we move on. One of the primary resources for this episode is a book titled The Power of Creative Destruction, Economic Upheaval and the Wealth of Nations. The book is a collection of essays and lectures curated by Philippe Aguillon and others who seek to contextualize the role innovation plays in building capitalist economies. To wrap our minds around it, here's Aguillon's definition in plain terms. Quote, Creative destruction is the process by which new innovations continually emerge and render existing technologies obsolete. New firms continually arrive to compete with existing firms, and new jobs and activities arise and replace existing jobs and activities. Creative destruction is the driving force of capitalism, ensuring its perpetual renewal and reproduction, but at the same time generating risks and upheaval that must be managed and regulated." End quote. So think about the horse and buggy being replaced by the automobile, or Netflix replacing blockbuster video. In each of these and the countless historical examples of creative destruction, more than the founding technology, there's always a supporting constellation of goods, services, and labor surrounding it. Agion refers to these as rents and renters, the saddle and the horseshoe maker, or the VHS machines and the dude that had to put all the tapes back on that crazy rewind thing because you were too lazy to be kind and rewind at home. Right, so pretty basic. The question at hand is whether or not the tech sector, with Silicon Valley as its figurehead proxy in the United States, has reached the end of creative destruction. Are we really innovating any longer? It's a question pondered by asshats like Peter Thiel. And if you don't know who he is, we did an entire episode on him that I'll link in show notes. Top level bio, Thiel is the co-founder of PayPal, a billionaire investor, and one of the biggest capital engines behind some of the most successful ventures in Silicon Valley. Anyway, here he is pondering this very notion. I would say um, that uh, there is a question how much, um, how much innovation is actually happening. And that's th that I always come back to where I'm, I'm somewhat on the sort of uh, side that we've, we've had, you know, generally sort of limited progress in technology and science the last 50 years. There was, you know, a very big exception in computers, software, internet, mobile internet the last quarter century. This was sort of this narrow cone of progress in the world of bits that, that, that really drove things. And, um, and I sort of wonder if, um, if um, there's actually less innovation possible even in those areas at this point. What's interesting about Thiel is that his prescriptions for curing what ails Silicon Valley and society in general are the exact opposite of what Agione and company determined from tomes of research. On Thiel's planet, people would drop out of college, the government would tax no one, and nation states would give way to the corporate oligarchy. He's a classic libertarian in every sense. It's part of what drives me nuts about people like him. Agione and most economists, not cut from the Chicago school cloth, argue that there are certain preconditions to successful innovation. The legal system, physical and technological infrastructure, education, social safety nets, and institutions. These are all necessary conditions to lay the foundation for a culture of innovation. That's the piece that Thiel and others of his ilk, who rail against the government intervention and taxes and regulations, are missing. So on one hand, 
Thiel is decrying the lack of innovation in the tech sector and claiming that real innovation hasn't taken place in 50 years. I'll grant him that, and you've heard me make this argument before. Iteration and improvements are distinct from true innovation. But if we look back to the period when people like Thiel believed innovation thrived in the United States and the European economies, they were characterized by three pillars. Investments into public education, public sector investment into private industry, and public welfare and social reforms. Obviously, the key word here is public, not private, public. Where we're aligned is in defining innovation. For better or worse, many of the technologies that we rely upon today came out of the Defense Department and the investments that they made during World War II. On the positive side, or maybe not, we have the Internet. Spawned from a research project within the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA, the Internet was originally known as ARPANET, borrowing from the agency name. This led to innovations such as GPS, which is definitely a positive thing for me, considering I have the worst sense of direction in human history. Or electronic medical records, a concept that started among doctors in the VA looking for a better way to track the troubled and transient population of veterans returning from foreign wars. On the flip side, of course, we have weapons of mass destruction and chemical agents used for biological and agricultural purposes, many of which have done more harm than good. Public sector investments into renewable energy, subsidizing companies like Tesla, for example, helped create an entire industry. Favorable trade agreements have allowed the U.S. companies to plunder natural resources and labor around the world used to manufacture everything from clothing to the lithium battery in your phone. Microprocessing capabilities developed by the government in collaboration with universities subsidized by government research grants. The list goes on. True innovation in the United States can be traced back in a straight line to government-funded or supported trials. A distinction must be made between innovation and entrepreneurship. The capitalist system allows for entrepreneurs of a certain background to thrive through access to capital, protections of physical and intellectual property, and a workforce that is available through exploitation or otherwise to perform critical functions that contribute to surplus wealth for the entrepreneur. The physical infrastructure, designed and maintained by several layers of government funding and agencies, allows for unfettered transportation of goods and services. And it requires a sophisticated financial system that is trusted and secure. Modern entrepreneurs like to pat themselves on the back and spin tales of their bootstrapping exploits. Self-made men are everywhere in places like Silicon Valley. Men who, quote, came from nothing only to wind up at the top of the mountain. A mountain that rises above the roads, bridges, and tunnels built by the government that transport their goods without fear of being stolen. A mountain that rises high above the legal system that was designed to protect their interests and ideas from being stolen. Ideas that originated in a lab, somewhere in a government program or a university setting, only to be set free for the entrepreneur to build upon and take credit for. All while doing everything in his power to avoid paying taxes to the very same government responsible for his position in life. And yes, I am using the male pronoun in all of these examples. Giants in the field of economics and the social sciences had been predicting the decline of capitalism at the hand of innovation for years. Keynes believed in the concept of what he called technological unemployment, whereby traditional laborers would be phased out of a capitalist system. Alvin Hansen called it secular stagnation. Thomas Malthus extrapolated his theory that the fixed production of agriculture would limit population growth to all sectors of the economy. But one of the great benefits of capitalism that challenged Malthusian theory, therefore, was the technological advances in agriculture production. M. King Hubbard predicted the end of fossil fuel production given the lifespan of proven oil reserves in the mid-20th century. And then, new reserves, offshore drilling, hydraulic fracturing, and other advances staved off Hubbard's claim and allowed the capitalist economies to continue drilling in the far reaches of the ocean and deep in the earth. From the Industrial Revolution forward, capitalism proved to be far more resilient than any of the great theorists imagined, which is why you find so many today that defend the system. That's not to say that an institutional rot can't set in. Beyond the necessary structural preconditions that foster innovations that we spoke of before, Agione and company also emphasize the necessity of competition. This is where our discussions about the Federal Reserve come back into focus when it comes to Silicon Valley. 
Relaxed credit standards that allowed for cheap money to flood Silicon Valley had the unintended consequence of propping up mediocre firms that might otherwise have gone out of business, giving them the artificial power of incumbency and thus preventing new entrants into the market. And many of the tech giants were able to snuff out competition by buying them outright with that same cheap money. This led to monopolistic tendencies in Silicon Valley with massive incumbent firms soaking up talent, capital, and market share. The opposite of healthy competition. And now the tech giants are coming into territory that they haven't been in for 16 years, the last time that the federal funds rate was this high. You know, right before the financial crisis. And the last time it was previously that high was in 1999, right before the dot-com crash. So investors know what's up. Wall Street knows what's up. The legacy tech giant leaders also know what's up, which is why you see them cutting payroll so aggressively. And now there's competition on the horizon from other parts of the world. The tech sector in Israel is booming. South Korea and China have formidable sectors growing at exponential rates, in some cases entirely due to government subsidies. AI threatens to further decentralize the tech landscape, offering opportunities to new renters of all shapes, sizes, and geographic locations to bolt onto existing technologies and take them to new heights. Iterations and improvements, but hardly innovations. So as the Fed continues to push rates and tech gurus spend more time navel-gazing than fundraising, the question remains as to whether the United States has the right formula to prevent this latest round of creative destruction from being the final chapter in a remarkable saga. The moment we finally pivot towards Schumpeter's sober socialism. Perhaps creative destruction is the engine of entrepreneurship and innovation, but that it has a natural life cycle. Perhaps we've reached the end of the useful technology. Sure, we'll continue to improve upon it, making things faster and more efficient and more powerful, but to what end? We already have the capacity to feed the poor, house the homeless, provide more leisure and security, ensure dignified retirements, and provide health care to all. We simply choose not to. There are other countries that choose to provide these things, and their citizens have just as much wearable technology as we do. They can access ChatGPT, search the internet, smoke good weed, and watch free porn. Theorists like Marx and Schumpeter might have disagreed over the journey, but arrived at kind of the same place. And history might reveal Schumpeter's vision as the proletariat probably isn't going to rise up for one simple reason. There isn't a proletariat. We're laborers, service workers, bureaucrats, and renters of technology that is developed through creative destruction and legacy systems and thinking. And the mediocre firms who muddled their way through the past two generations of technological advancements did so due to the largesse of the cheap money fed and government contracts. With the Fed chickens coming home to roost and conservatives fighting tooth and nail against investments into the pillars of the very capitalist structures they hold so dear, we find ourselves in a strange predicament, designing a future where everyone has a smartphone on a dead planet. The ultimate example of creative destruction at the hands of mercenary capitalists. Here endeth the lesson.